One, two, three, four. This is Zachary Alford, drummer for David Bowie, B-52s, Bruce Springsteen, Gwen Stefani, Kelly Clarkson, Tomoyasu Hote, and Nana, among others. Not only is Zach one of the most accomplished drummers in rock history, he's in my top five influences in developing my own drumming style. Zach is from the Upper West Side, New York, where he rubbed elbows with masters such as Charlie Drayton, Sterling Campbell, and Steve Jordan. Being initially influenced by family and friends, Zach was surrounded by music at a very young age. His neighborhood was exploding with talent, including the building where he lived. Famous music clubs were just within steps of his home, and running into the funk and jazz elite were a daily occurrence. Not only was he a budding superstar drummer, he was able to draw inspiration out of the New York graffiti scene, crossing over into the breakdance phenomenon. He was even taught by the legendary Frosty Freeze. In this chat, we talk about Zach's early influences, like the aforementioned Steve Jordan, Charlie Drayton, Sterling Campbell, Tony Williams during the Alan Holdsworth era, and of course Ringo, Bonham, and late 70s punk and new wave bands. My favorite of his influences, however, is the song Still the One by Orleans and the drummer Jerry Murata. As Zach was sharpening his skills and woodshedding to more fusion, he said his ultimate goal was not to be a fusion drummer, but to be in Funkadelic. Besides playing with monster artists, Zach's had a few other bands where he's had more of a leading role in composing and arranging. These include the rock band Body Bag and the jam band Media, featuring Gail Ann Dorsey, also from David Bowie's band. We talk a little bit about maintaining a healthy lifestyle in the rock and roll world and how to sustain a career. This includes diet, exercise, staying away from drugs and alcohol, and most important, how Tower of Power's David Garibaldi is good for your nervous system. As far as my condition, he says it's very tempting to give up, but just keep doing it. Don't take too much time off when you're frustrated. For a dude with such a Hall of Fame resume, believe it or not, Zach has never had an agent or a manager. That should tell you everything you need to know about his work ethic, his talent, and his positive attitude throughout his career. For any young musician with stars in their eyes, Zach is the perfect example of how to adapt from room to room with confidence, the importance of not being a jerk, how to check your ego at the door, see the Dunning-Kruger effect here, and how to play your role, whether it be to stick to the book or show off your arsenal in order to take your current gig to the next level. This was one of my favorite interviews and I'd been looking forward to it for a long time. Here is the ultra-patient and grounded Zachary Alford. 
uh, Roger Fisher, the original guitar player of Heart, hired me to start this new Heart band. And um, I love Heart. Yeah. And so, yeah, to hear like uh, Barracuda and Magic Man, like the intro to Magic Man in your in ears, <laughs> and you're like, that's the guy. Um, so like that falls into it. You know, I've, I've seen some of your, you're interviewed by Dom. Um, I had a chat with him a while back, but like, you know, play the script versus having more freedom to show your personality and stuff like that. There, there was a lot of play the script in that band, which was fine because I'm a huge Michael DeRozier fan. Like, mm -hmm. I'll, and they've had so many lineup changes through that band. It's like I've always gravitated to the Michael DeRozier thing live because he was just so crazy live. It would huh. rarely, rarely be. Who were some of the other drummers they had? Um, well, the most recent, no, so he's a, Ben Smith was, it, was there for like 15 or 16 years. Um, he's a local guy. And uh, Denny Carmassi was there kind of in the 80s during the, the two big comeback records, uh, Bad Animals and Heart. Um, and then Ben Smith took over after that. And who's playing now? I think Ann Wilson's solo band drummer is in there now. I'm not familiar with him. Mm -hmm. But Ben came by the hospital after the accident and he kind of explained like why he was leaving the band and, and, and stuff like that. But he's super busy because talk about mentors like he's a Seattle guy and when he can't do uh stuff he calls me when he has to leave and do something across the country he's like hey can you fill in on this thing that I'm usually this guy Leroy Bell who is on the voice uh um talent show that tv show or he's a yeah, yeah. R&B guy I fill in when Ben can't do that and uh this Tower of Power cover band called um Dr. Funk which mm -hmm. is great for because I'm you know just off the top I'm a post grunge pop punk self taught drummer, right? That was supremely influenced by you because I wanted to be a technician. I wanted to be that guy who um, could grab from all genres, you know, and go into any room and get the gig. Mm -hmm. But I didn't do enough jazz in the beginning. I wanted to play Wipeout in front of a bunch of my classmates and get in a band and do that and i and i did that too and you you started playing clubs in, in 12 13 14 or whatever and i did that too i just wasn't i was influenced in, um just in more i don't know i guess uh neanderthal kind of like oh i needed you know i played football and i needed to um hit stuff and i loved rock and roll and all that type of stuff but with the injury yeah, drums is good for that <laughs> yeah oh my gosh super good therapy especially now you know and that's why uh I'll get to this in, in just two seconds, but the, being in a band, the, the Tower Power cover band thing, or this R&B stuff, where I don't have to slam it so hard, where I'm not, because I come from Screamo, early, early aughts, Screamo festival, everyone's competing, how hard can you fit, hit, how fast are you, Yeah, yeah. all this stuff, and now it's, because of my injuries, it's making me play differently, which is great, because now I actually, I actually have to listen to the other band members, like there's a horn section over there. You know, there's there's mm -hmm. vocalists on that side of the stage. Right. People right. are used to hearing the song a certain way. And um they're and you know, all the players are usually older. They're total shredders, you know, A list studio shredders, but they'll give me the evil eye or whatever, just like, uh, you know, settle down. You know, they, the bass player, his name's Jimmy Cliff. He was in Richard Mark's band during all the hits. Oh wow. Yeah, so um anyway, so when, when Ben can't do that, I do that. But it's it's a perfect fit for me because I don't have to go out and like really slam it because I'm world, uh, there's so much nerve damage from the crash. So I'm still working back in. And just even as of last night, you know, getting ready to talk to you, just seeing like your, your Vader, the triangulation video. Um, as you can imagine, like, you know, C6, that affects my hands and my feet. So they're, they're numb and tingling all the time. But I can't, you know, I can hold stuff. I can play and I can teach, but I guess if I had a secret weapon, it was, I'm a single kick drummer. It was my feet, the speed of my feet, you know? So I'm trying to mm. get that real quick twitch stuff back. I can do the basic stuff to, to get the gig or, or I can still play shows, but getting that stuff back is, is a slow process. Right. But playing to your stuff like that or, or stuff off of Earthling, my wife's a drummer too. And she wow, really? sings and <laughs> she's a, she's an amazing singer songwriter. She does everything. She's, she's an audio. She's, she's putting oh, in wow. the audio for the new hockey team um, in Seattle. 
she's drawing all the diagrams and telling people pointing and telling people what to do yeah she's cool. a total genius but she came home last night and she heard me playing she's like so what therapy did you go to today was it the electrical stuff was it the stuff that you injected was it the uh the special uh, was it the reiki guy or i was like no i was just i was playing to zach's stuff and i felt emotional about it i felt really good she's like that sounded really different so that's not mm. medicate that's not supplements that's not someone pushing on, on all their body weight on somewhere on my spine. That's just, that just came from the heart. Like I remember, I remember the cosmic thing tour. <laughs> I saw that three times, you know, and that's wow. what initially got, that's what initially made, you know, the tractor beam to your style. Um, I grew up in opposite of you. I was, um, I grew up on the beach in LA. You were in New mm. York. And you were influenced by your friends and even people in your building and you had clubs very close. I was, it was pulling teeth trying to get people to jam when I was trying to learn drums. I, I, you know, LA is really spread out as you know, and you got to drive everywhere. And I was looking up in the phone book. Hey, do you want to jam? Hey, do you want to jam? There was like zero um, peer. Influence. How old were you? You were like, what? Okay. Uh, I saw a guy play Wipeout in junior high in the quad and everyone went crazy and they went back to class and they're like, did you see that? So that was day one. Like, I have to do that. I need that attention. I have to. So I went to the swap meet that weekend and I bought a crappy drum set and a friend of mine bought a crappy guitar. Probably had like seven strings on it, totally mangled. And then we started jamming in my mom's living room. But then I heard the first Pretenders record and there was a, just a mix of stuff besides like the language and Martin Chambers playing there was in Chris Thomas's production and Chrissy Hines delivery and all this stuff. It really, that really changed everything for me. I wanted to do mm -hmm. that. Songs. Yeah. And Martin was doing like this kind of Bonham thing, but his own way he was doing Bonham stuff, but just a little different kind of like DeRoger does. And, um, and he did that live and then he turned it into triplets. And I was like, what is going on? That's, mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. a four piece kit. You know? right. So that, that was, that was the start of everything. I wasn't really, like, really a metal head or whatever. I was a new wave guy. I was K rock 106.7 LA new wave. Um, and then the, you know, the B 52s, I knew all about them. I read, I read about them in surfer magazines. That's where I got all my new music information that was coming around the corner. But when that record hit, you know, and I, I was at the Universal Amphitheater, I think, in LA. That was the first one I saw, and I saw, I saw a couple other in the area, but just the energy that you had, the, emo the, the stuff coming from your heart coming off the stage, it's like you had such a recognizable sound, you know. Once I heard about other bands you were playing in after that, it's like, yeah, like you can blindfold me you could put Stuart Copeland and Phil Rudd and Alex Van Halen and Jim Keltner and, and Larry Mullen, whatever, line them all up. It's the swing and it's the way you hit the snare drum. And you had that. I, it, listening to the Billy Joel record, you know, Earthling or whatever, it's, I can hear it coming off your snare and I can hear it, I can hear your swing. And that, I think, is once you have that sound, you know, that's, you, you start to build that resume and you, you're just killing it. Like you, like you said, I, th I don't think you have an agent or you, maybe you didn't for a while. Or you don't have a man. No, it's no, never did. You. That's crazy. And I, I think it's, it's like the little things, uh, cause you were, you were influenced or you were friends with Charlie Drayton. He was a New York guy also. Yeah, we, we weren't exactly friends. I met him when I was 15, but when he was, and he was 15 at the same time, but he was, uh, you know, he was already so off in his own world that he was meeting people all the time who were coming up saying, oh, you sound great and all that. So he doesn't even remember that meeting. I, I told him about it a couple of years ago and he was like, oh, wow, really? And, I was, and then it hit me like 30 years later, like you'd never remembered that. I thought he remembered me all these years because I hooked up with him again in the 80s. Uh, when I was playing with Body Bag, because my bass player was a good friend of his. And so I thought he remembered me all this time, and it was just like we were reconnecting. But I think his first memories of me are from those hangs in, in the 80s when our bands were playing together. And then afterwards, we would go 
you know, drink and party at Steve Jordan's house all night. But, so, yeah. so, but I was watching him and I was hugely influenced by him. Um, and friends, and he was, he was going to music and art, which I didn't go to. Um, I went to Bronx Science, the high school, and he went yeah. to music and art along with Sterling and right. my other friend Phoenix and, um, you know, a handful of other people I know who, who did know him. So I always felt like I knew him and I had met him. Yeah. And I was watching him and, you know, so to me, he was always there, but I don't think he feels quite the same. Yeah. But um, I associate you. Uh, I'm trying, I'm going to try not to do the whole your life story thing and make and make it too long. One, because I, I don't know you that well. And number two, I'm not a biographer. I'm not very good at it. So I'm just going stuff, how you, how you influenced my career. So I, I associate you with Cosmic Thing, but... Dr Charlie Drayton actually played on that record on a few yeah. songs, right? And songs yeah. that tracks like Bushfire and Junebug, which aren't the most popular track, those are the ones. This and another thing I, I associate with you is uh, what's around the corner. You're unpredictable, rock solid, but there could be something really cool just ahead. And ah. and stuff like when I saw you live with Junebug and Bushfire in the way, and I think it's from where you grabbed your jazz, which I didn't dig into a lot of jazz, but the. Um, just, just this kind of stuff that, you know, not, not a lot of drummers think of that you have to grab from funk, you, you grab from jazz. And I was like, that's not from a normal B-52s record from the past. Right. That is taking it somewhere else. And that's what right. I thought. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And in so, junior high school, I listened to, um, I got really into fusion. Mm -hmm. Um, I wasn't, I, I didn't grow up listening to bebop, but I was listening to fusion. And so drummers like Billy Cobham and Steve Gadd, um, Rayford Griffin, uh, also, you know, Terry Bozio, guys oh, like yeah. that. I was, you know, and Zappa, I was listening to Zappa. So, so there was a lot of, but, but mainly, mainly like Cobham and Lenny White and uh, Gadd. Um, th that's where I was getting a lot of my jazz influence from. Tony Williams. Uh, um, but again, not the Tony Williams, um, you know, Bob stuff that he was doing with Miles, the modal stuff, but the, uh, his later stuff uh, in the lifetime where he's playing with Alan Hallsworth. Mm -hmm. That was, that was a big um, influence on me too. So, so I was incorporating that, incorporating that into my pop playing, which like you say, I wasn't hearing other drummers really do that. And so while I was definitely living and absorbing all of the 80s pop stylings um, and had a foundation in, you know, Ringo and Bonham, uh, I was seeping in a little bit of the, uh, the fusion stuff. But I didn't want to be a fusion player. That wasn't my, my dream. You know, yeah. my dream was to be in Funkadelic. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's why a lot of people say that, like they don't necessarily predict the kind of fills I'll do. Um, and, yeah, and you said, you also said you were a B-52s fan. So it's like, if you get an invite yeah. to an audition for that, it's like, yeah, I'm totally in. I mean, you, you liked that um, early, I mean, New York was so important back in the late 70s, uh, early 80s. To, I was just talking with uh, uh, Chris Franz uh oh. a few months back so um very important in that uh, i'm sure you were around to see all that go down and blondie and all that stuff so it's like but what a mix i mean even in just in in your vader video you're this is like on display like here's my metal here's my jungle here's my high speed stuff here's my fusion Here, here's uh here's how i can improvise it's it's really cool. It's like it's it's uh, I don't know. You're like you're like a painter, you know. And at the same time, it's like you can drop in and just play the script, you know. And I've I've talked to a lot of drum heroes, who might be as much as I love them, but I don't think they would be hired for, you know, a certain session gig because they do that one thing, you know. But you've mm -hmm. been in so many rooms, with totally opposite influences, and. 
it's that it's that foundation from that that I think it's that nuclear that competitive yet supportive um, New York um, cluster of talent that you grew up with, plus being influenced by you know poppier stuff, the B-52s and, and New Wave and stuff like that that like really built your foundation that not a lot of other people have. They just want to do the one thing and they were famous for the one thing. And that's great if you can make a career off that for sure. Yeah. Uh, but if you have a sound and you don't have an agent, I mean, that's, that's like Hall of Fame resume stuff right there. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, me being like post grunge, punk pop, all the, the festival, um, early two thousands or whatever. It's like, the reason I want to talk to you, uh, besides, trying to relearn stuff to bring my healthy energy back is to shout you out to maybe my peers who thought like I did something cool. It's like, this is where I got my cool stuff. People who may not know. I mean, all the drummers in the know know who you are, but maybe there's another generation or just into something else and they don't know the cool stuff. So I wanted to shine a light on a, someone who should, who should, uh, get the proper attention. So that's how we're oh, here. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I loved I love the fact that Orlean still the one that was like your main, that was one of your main jams that, you know, you couldn't wait to practice to, or that, that was kind of like your foundation when you were, when you were starting. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I had the Those, 45. Hit makers. Those guys are hit makers dance with me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that was all over the radio at the time. So yeah, I bought the 45 and, uh, um, it's funny because I didn't know that the, the drummer on that was Jerry Murata, who I met when I moved up to Woodstock. And um, he told me the story, like, for whatever reason, I think, I think the drummer got really sick and couldn't make that session. And uh, it, it may not have been sick, but for whatever reason, he didn't, he didn't make it to the session and Jerry got to, to go and it's like that wreck that that tune was so big it was a massive hit so he just uh you know it was a roll of the dice there i was listening to it again last night uh did you as you were getting better and better at it or more confident did you ever try to sneak like the purdy shuffle into it no 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 <laughs> i didn't I, I wasn't aware of the purdy shuffle until years years left oh, yeah, after yeah. that um it's still an interesting but, kick pattern. It's not, it's the, the kick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I loved, I loved the, um, the, the way it didn't just repeat exactly the same, but it kind of had little variations and then it repeated in a larger cycle, but it kept repeating that larger cycle. Yeah. And that created its own kind of little, you know, bigger cycle of like hypnotic uh, groove. Yeah. So that, that always stuck with me, that concept. And you were a Zeppelin guy too, and you started getting into, yes. you started getting into, the, into these bands uh -huh. that I wish I got into when you were getting into them, but I kept just going down more of the rock thing and maybe, I don't know, Bosio instructional tapes or um, trying to get those weird, I was always trying to mimic which you do a lot of perfectly trying to mimic a but double bass with a single bass um, in different hand patterns and, and stuff like that. And that's another thing I'm trying to, that's another one of my checklists as I'm trying to retrain my spine. Um, yeah. I don't want to get back, but it's when it's sound, when it sounds smooth, it's, it's, it's really sweet. And I like how you, I like how you work that in, like even in the Billy Joel stuff, yeah. even though that's, Oh yeah, that's, that's Zach snare, you know, but then you'll sneak in a little, um, a little sixteenth, quick sixteenth symbol thing, you know, into, you know, more of a standard rock song. And it's like that's it. That's there it is. You know, that's why it's not this other drummer with with Springsteen. And I I'm not, um, you know, a gigantic Springsteen fan, but I know what a gigantic gig that was. And for you to fly back and forth so many times and not know like really what was going on. Um, that was one of the gigs where it was more like play the script, maybe less personality, or did he give, did he give you a little more flexibility down the line during, during the, the, the tours? Um, I think, I think we didn't, you know, it wasn't something that was discussed. 
it was like learn the song and then come in and play it. And uh, the records that he was uh, promoting at the time, which is what we rehearsed mainly in the beginning, was the Lucky Town record. And a lot of that is Jeff Picaro. So it was exactly the kind of stuff I would have wanted to play anyway. Yeah. So I really didn't have to um, uh, alter it much. Um, and if I did, it was so much in the same character that, you know, you can feel when it's allowable, you know? I mean, if, if, a, if a Phil is just gonna be, um, uh, da, 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 you know, you know that, well, it could also be, Da, 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 da. You know, it's like you've got room there to to just be spontaneous, but it still should basically say the same thing. Um, as far as playing Max parts, I really tried to to you know his his parts were a bit more uh, compositional, so so I, I did stick to his parts tighter, I think actually. Mm -hmm. But you know, we have such different fields that you know if i'm playing born to run it feels completely different than when max is playing born to run um and bruce was open to that you know he had a whole new band so he was open to everything feeling a little different um but i really did feel that i didn't want to stray from max's parts they were so important uh to to the to the entirety of bruce's music you know that band really made his sound with him any dirty looks during maybe like two or three shows in of your first tour where he's like, Oh, never. I thought you were going to do da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, Bruce, yeah. uh, Bruce is not a dirty look kind of guy. Okay. It's really uh, amazing. You know, he can be having all kinds of problems, technical problems on stage where lots of other famous artists would throw a fit and, yeah. you know, he'll, he'll never let that show. He's having a problem, um, and there's there's no you know um, after show meeting where you get chewed out or none of that kind of stuff, you know. Um, so early on, playing you know playing with Duff, and we do do Guns N' Roses stuff when we're touring. And early on, when I was the new guy, I I, I would get stuff like because he he plays bass when you're doing the Guns N' Roses stuff, and he's like, "Is that the fill you're gonna do?" Like when I was getting a little too creative, and I was like. <laughs> I just want to make sure that's the one you're going to do. <laughs> yes, yes. That's sir. a real friendly way of saying, you know, <laughs> make sure you do it right or don't do it. Or do that same thing every time. So right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But there's been a few of those, you know, to the audition thing. Uh, like I did the fly back and forth thing several times for Offspring a few years back. I didn't end up getting it. I got mm. into like the final two or whatever, but I knew that was a band where it was very much by the script. Play it like the record, you know. But mm. I got auditioned for the Pumpkins in like 2009, and that couldn't be any more flexible. Like I, I came in learning the whole catalog with no preparation. I asked the manager, like, hey, what do you want to prep me on anything? And, and she's like, uh, just have fun. You know, so I can go to. I get up there, and he's like not even playing guitar. He's, he's on keys. And we're, we're like jamming on um, curveball, shoegazer, Brit pop stuff, and we're just jumping all over the place, you know. And, and then we'd he'd sit down, we'd have a sushi lunch, and then get back and jam some more. I was like, I don't even know what I'm doing right now, but it's like total extreme. So, um, with your auditions, you don't have to name any names, but it seems like you've nailed everything. Have you ever gone to like a high profile audition and you didn't get it? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Um, I went to uh, a Madonna audition. Uh, I can't remember the name of the tour, but it was <clears throat> it was uh, probably around two thousand two or something. And um, she was looking for a guy who was doing electronics, and I really. You know, I've I've done it on gigs, but usually it's a kind of thing where um, that's not the main reason I'm there. And so it's easy to just incorporate it into my setup because all I'm doing is maybe, you know, hooking up some drum triggers to the kick and snare for 
you know, four or five songs, and then maybe I've got a pad or two to trigger something, but it's not who I am. Uh, and she was looking for for someone who really had that thing, and and it's, you what know, it's one of those. I mean, you have awkward. your pads to trigger stuff. What what does it, drummer into electronics mean be, beyond that? You want to be a uh, DJ well, at the same time. It means you've got um, first of all, you can show up with your setup, hmm. which you know usually I would show up to rehearsal and then, you know, call someone to say, Hey, can you help me <laughs> hook up some uh, triggers? Oh. Um, you know, it means that you already have your whole library of sounds. You've already got everything super dialed in so that nothing's triggering something else. Hmm. Uh, and maybe even have a brand new cutting edge triggering system, which doesn't have the problems that they, you know, for years were plagued with. Her sounds, the sounds that are on the record, or just uh, yeah, or 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 just you know they might want to see what you can do creatively, which mm -hmm. is like means you've been working on it, you know. Whereas I would just exactly that I would come in and just reproduce uh, the sounds, but um, they might either want you to uh, to see what you can do, yeah. which means you have to have spent time with it you know, uh, messing around. And, and that electronics is kind of thing that takes hours and hours and hours of experimentation. You know, a lot of knob twiddling, a lot of, you know, searching, you know, trying different samples. It's, it's a full-time thing. Any apps these days. Well, now it's, it's definitely a bit easier, you know, and, and I would, I would, I would feel more comfortable going into a full on electronic gig now because I, I feel that, it would be easier to to get a set together. And actually, I've got a few things that um, I want to dust off and get ready because I have a gig coming up where I might be doing some of that, um, which I don't want to say what it is because I don't want to jinx it. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, hey, uh, speaking of... Oh, but, but the, anyway, the funny story about that was um, I had some drum triggers and, I've, and during toward the end of the audition, she goes, so do you have... Uh, electronic drums and I said um, well I have a bunch of pads but I don't have a brain and everyone laughed like aha and she goes yeah you better not let that get around <laughs> yeah I remember that I think I had one SDS 1000 it was one of the one of the originals like back in the late 80s or something oh Simmons mm -hmm. yeah Simmons stuff and then I saw Martin use it on that learning to crawl record he had this white kit Everything was white with white hardware he made from Germany. It looked like this big Tron piece of plastic or whatever with these two Simmons that were elevated. I was like, okay, that's what cool, that's what cool people do. That was like the, the, the start of the whole yeah. trigger thing, you know, the, the early 80s. But Well, that would have been a cool gig. Not like that you needed more. Um, it's funny because I was used to a thing where it was really about the band. You know, playing with Bruce, he interacts so much with the band. Uh, with the B-52s, it really was about a band. And, you know, we, we all shared uh, the dressing rooms. I mean, the girls had their dressing room, and then the guys had a shared dressing room all, all together. So, you know, the Madonna thing would have been a big switch because that was really about the singer. So that would have been the first time I would have been in a situation like that. So fun, maybe. Uh, <laughs> I remember seeing the video. I went to Japan the year that she did that tour and I was playing pool um, somewhere in Rapungi. I think it was uh, the Hard Rock um, Cafe. And they had the, the live Madonna video up on the TV. And I just remember looking at it going, wow, you never see the band. <laughs> but, yeah, that's true. You know, who, you know, who might have nitpicked, but, uh, but I just wasn't used to that. I was used to being like part of the main, you know, the you main course. You kind of barely saw the band in the in the big movie. Yeah, truth or dare. I mean, they, there were some backstage shots. There wasn't a lot of band stuff. Uh, yeah, no, it's it's, foot, yeah. it's not that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, one step back. So Keith, he went from guitar or drums to guitar. Was there ever any exchange? Like, he, it wasn't. Um, I mean, Keith, I don't think, was a jazz drummer when he was doing all the B-52s records before that. But no. did you have any exchanges like, hey, because um, I, I heard you explain that you wanted to play that more straight. You wanted to play it more punk. You didn't want to funk it up too much. 
So did you have uh, many drummer exchanges while you were? No, actually, I wish we had had more. Uh, he really just let me do whatever, and he seemed to be happy with it. Um, looking back on it uh, now, I wish I wish he had. I wish we had discussed things more. That would have been really interesting. Hmm. But you brought it, like I said, you brought it to another level, and that's where I was at learning the drums. Um, so, you know, re playing along with Earthling and, and your and your Vader video and stuff like that, I can't imagine, like, I'm, I'm going to use the word fun again, but you said it was more relaxed environment once you were accepted into the Bowie camp um, and you were prepping to tour. He wanted to do all these old classics in a different way. And I think that's more more freedom right there. I even saw some clip of, like, Lust for Life or something a couple of days ago that was more down-tempo um, kind of version yeah. that I've never heard before. But, I mean, that's the kind of different he, he was looking for. When you finally got into the... St oh, and also, like, the Scary Monsters video, which I think is, like, flying off the YouTube charts or whatever. I, I taught at the, school, the local school of rock here as a music director before I started my old school, my own school at the house. And I was doing the Bowie show and I would show the drummers like, this is where the way we're gonna play Scary Monsters right here. This is the way we're gonna do it. Not uh, which show. one are you talking about? 96, um, I think it was the outside tour. Like it was, it was outdoor festival. Oh, outdoor, okay. Yeah, that one. Um, I think if you like, you go on YouTube and you just type in Scary Monsters Live, it's the first one that pops up. But uh, you, but you know, there's a bunch of loops going on, and uh, it's just crazy. Like, and it Reeves is just totally going off, and it was just really electric and exciting version of that song. So I was trying to push <clears throat> that version of it to my my kids who are in the band. And then you brought that band into the studio after that to do Earthling. Yeah. Okay. Which seemed, you know, have you you. You say uh, there's there's jungle loops and it, it sounds like there's more like of an industrial influence, propeller heads, Chemical Brothers, Nine Inch Nails, whatever. And like I was like, wow, this is super cool. I'm into this. Were you? In yeah, yeah, it was cool. I mean, as I said, uh, I think you were alluding to. I I was at first disappointed that that we couldn't play them the way I grew up hearing them, mm. uh, but it was still interesting. You know, because any idea David has is going to be interesting, and um, and it was it was a challenge. Uh, and but the cool thing about it is, it meant that I had to make it mine. You know, yeah. I had every you know I I could maybe allude to the original versions. Maybe was there might be a fill that I thought, okay, this one has to be the same one that. Uh, Woody Woodmansey played or, or it's whatever. Too classic. It's too, too classic. Yeah. But other, otherwise, things were so drastically different that I had to just make it mine. And now in retrospect, I see the value of that. And, and I, I can only thank David for, um, for giving me that opportunity. With all these loops going on and the jungle influence, as far as the process... Did David come in with a chord skeleton and a melody, and then you sat down and helped with the rhythm stuff? Was it was it more of a, or did you, or were the loops done and you just kind of fit yourself into the loops? Um, most of the loops were done. There was one a uh, song called "Telling Lies" where where I sat with Mark alone in the studio and we worked on the loops, uh, constructing them by you know I was, we were I actually played the patterns and we manipulated them. Uh, basically just speeding them up. Um, but um, but a lot of the stuff Mark had actually programmed with David. Yeah. Beforehand. So so it was it was uh, just coming in and adding drums on top of it for, for most of that record. It's a song looking for satellites is like the second track. Uh-huh. So <clears throat> You have the loops going on, but I mean, it's 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 straight ahead, but it has an odd meter feel to it. Is that you like this is the way I'm going to present it, or are they like, hey, we want the beat to be a little more complicated? Um, you know, I walked in, 
they 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 threw that up on the speakers and said this is the song and i was like oh, okay it's a kind of a, a six four feel yeah and uh not something i do a lot so i didn't know what i was going to play i just went in and played whatever whatever felt like it fit and that was it wow that's crazy that's that's not a normal thing for a drummer just to run it and uh <laughs> i mean it is really unique it's really creative to go in and and like I mean, we had a similar that. situation in um on the next day with uh um if you can see me mm -hmm. but there wasn't a track there was only a demo uh but the demo had uh, there were actually two demos there was one that sterling campbell had worked on where he created a beat in five that he that he worked in with it and then there was the original demo that Dave did with the drum machine where it was just a four four pattern repeating and the whole band the whole band david is playing over all the instruments in a, a meter of five mm. and i chose to use that approach because again it wasn't uh I mean, it would have been very cool to come up with a beat in five. I just didn't have one handy. And then I thought, you know, it would be equally as cool to not come up with a beat in five because uh, it would create a tension and it would create a, a kind of dissonance, a rhythmic dissonance that maybe would bring something interesting to the song. And, you know, and so I just approached it like that. I'm afraid of Americans. Uh... Was it just the remix that that uh, Trent was helping with the production, or did he actually was he? That's like, correct. Like, no, yeah, I see a lot on the you know in comments and on the internet, people think that Trent like co-produced the record or something. No. It had nothing to do with the record, uh, but there was a remix that David passed on to him to do, and it was I'm afraid of Americans. Yeah. Uh, he also did a remix of uh, Heart's Filthy Lesson too, but. Um, I don't know that, you know, it was, it wasn't the single, you know, the yeah. single with the video was, was the record version. So that's yeah. what people know. Um, and then live, we did uh, a version closer to Trent's remix. So right. uh, even though, and in fact, that was the first song we recorded for Earthling. Um, huh. No, I'm sorry. Telling Lies was getting confused, but um but I don't think we've ever played it, you know, played the record version live. Because by the time we, the record was out, um, you know, I could be wrong. Maybe in some early, early leg of the tour, we did do the record version. But we very quickly switched to Trent's uh, live arrangement. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, it was a perfect fit. I mean, I love the remix. I love both versions. I mean, you actually hear my drums in there for like one bar. <laughs> <laughs> Just before the last chorus. Industrial Trent thing. Cut it up. Yeah. Uh, even in a downward spiral, it's like I read how many drummers were on that and... I don't think anyone really played through the whole song once. It's, I just hear cut up stuff all over the place, but that, that's what made that sound. Yeah. yeah, no, it's brilliant. That was so exciting to tour with them and uh, hang out with them. And and that was really my first exposure to industrial music. So wow, um, it was like an eye opener, you know? And, and it, was, it was really good for us too, because they had already, besides being a band, Mm -hmm. They had already done this, you know, massive world tour. And then Dave says, hey, you want to come back? They had finished. And Dave was like, can you please come and do one leg, one more leg with us? And, but it meant that here we are having to follow this well-oiled machine. Mm -hmm. And we had never even played together before. And I mean, Reeves had played with David in Tin Machine. Yeah. And Mike, of course, had been with David for years. And Carlos had been with David for years. But all the rest of us... Uh, Gail, me, um, well, yeah, Gail, oh, and Peter Schwartz, who was the original um, musical director for the Outside Tour. Uh, we'd never played with David, so, and none of us had ever played together. Gail had never played with David. Uh, so, so we're trying to, like, you know, come up to the level of this brilliant, 
industrial band that's just destroying it, you know, every night. So that, that was really good because it, it, it really, you know, it really kicked us into gear. <laughs> My first experience with Nine Inch Hills it was the very first Lollapalooza and I, I got like 10th row seats or something. It was in uh, Irvine, California. And my girlfriend was there and Trent took a huge bottle of water and threw it out in the crowd and it hit her right in the face. And it, she was bleeding all over the place. <laughs> it, was like, it was like two songs in. I was like, wow, I love this. Not what's, what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not loving that so much. Not loving it anymore. But I was still a fan after that. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you were saying that you were interested in industrial uh, kind of late. I, I consider Reeves like an industrial guitar player. Like I'm, I'm a huge uh, Tin Machine fan. He, he kind of reminds me of Aiden Blue and that kind of like avant-garde, sync things that are out of the box sounds and stuff. But I think he would, he would be a perfect industrial guitar player to edit. And it seems like he gravitates towards that, trying to come up with sounds that you're not used to you know or, or yeah. imp impromptu solos and things like that they could just chop up and make um industrial sounds environmental sounds yeah you hear that actually a lot on the song um seven years in tibet there's all these guitar squeals and squawks and stuff those were samples he played from the keyboard of himself mm -hmm. wow yeah that makes sense i saw some nina live footage in it I had no idea that, again, growing up in the 80s and, and K-Rock and these new wave hits that come out, I had no idea her stage production was so elaborate because you hear just the hits, you know, that, that mm -hmm. made it in the States. You really don't know about her history so much, you know, as you're, as you're just hearing the hits. And it's like, it reminded me, because I, I did have a little Blue Man band experience. It reminded me of like kind of a Blue Man show with like four people playing drums and the light show, and then there's you back there, and everything's syncopated. What kind of a, a tour preparation do you do um, with so many percussionists? Um, like how, how long does that take to, to sync that up and prepare for something like that? And well, heavily involved with... It would have been nice if, it, if we spent more time, actually. Yeah. Uh, she likes to rehearse really quickly and then just jump out there. Mm. Um, so I think we, we only rehearsed for a week. Uh, and there was a lot of material to cover, but luckily, um, the other guy in the band who plays drums and guitars and, uh, her sons who were in the band, uh, they're all really talented and, and musical. And so, um, that came together, you know, pretty quickly actually, but but it took a lot of focus. It took a, you know, we had we didn't have much time to work on that actually. Mm -hmm. Have you done multiple tours with her? Uh, yes, three. Okay, I was, I was also checking out uh, some live Stefani stuff, and I know in your background you grew up around graffiti artists, and you're talking about break dancing. And I saw a clip where you know she actually has dancers who did the break dancing, and I thought, what a perfect drummer to know where to what the perfect timing is while, while they're break dancing than you, you know, it's like, that's, that's your jam. You know, how that works. it was, it was kind of fun. I felt a little connection with those guys. They were all much younger, mm -hmm. but you know, um, they knew a guy who was the one who I, you know, grew up learning to dance with frosty freeze uh, who lived, you know, just uh, two blocks from me. And uh, so when I told them that, they were just, they just loved me. They were like, yo, you're a people. In fact, I even have this, <laughs> this video they, they, they taped because they, they had, um, it was the year that the iPhone came out. So they all had iPhones and they had camcorders and they were making videos the whole tour. And um, there was this one time that they actually invited me out to one of their uh, competitions, b-boy competitions that, you know, whenever that they had a chance on a day off, they would go to these things. And I came to one and they actually made me get up there and try and remember what I could do, which was almost nothing. Um, There's video but, of that? Uh, yeah, yeah, they, they, made, they made a tape of it. Cool. Gave it to me. Um, and you toured with her multiple times. I'm, I'm trying to get the timeline between, you played with Kelly Clarkson too, right? 
Right in the middle. Um, right in the Gwen's middle. first tour was 2005. And then um, it was supposed to be a world tour. But after two months, we had to cut it short because she was having her baby. Mm. And in 2006, she took off. And that's when I jumped onto the Kelly Clarkson tour. Then 2007, she did her world tour for her next record, uh, The Sweet Escape. And did you play on those records also? No, no, those are all, uh, I don't know if there are any drummers on those. So I know they're mostly programmed. <laughs> there might be a drummer on one or two songs, I don't know, but yeah. uh, it would have been whoever that producer she was with used. Um, so uh, yeah, no, no one in the band I think was involved in any of those records. You studied a little bit of piano or maybe a lot. I don't know. You, you mentioned piano uh, and that's you. It made more sense to you than than playing the guitar, but still having that piano background. The way you play drums is more um, like a composer to me. So did you uh, there's been Body Bag and there's a new project called Media. Were you were you ever in a project or do you have one going now where you're actually the front man singing? No, um, no, yep. no, but you know. a writer. Um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm trying to write more. Um, I did some writing in body bag, but not much. Uh, nothing, nothing that's on the EP that you you'll see on iTunes or Spotify, but, um, but we did have one song that I wrote that we used to play, uh, and media, that wasn't so much uh, uh, writing as it was. We just jammed a lot and then um, edited stuff out of the jams. Okay. Um, but I do, I do still have, you know, I still have the dream of writing a, an album one day. Have you ever been asked to sing back up while you were a touring drummer? Yeah, I sing backups a lot in Japan, actually, when I toured with Hote. Okay. Hote Tomoyasu. That's right. There's a couple other things. I have this little school. It's called Loud House. I used to do, be music director, you know, at this, the 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 big corporate machine. But I have this thing called the Drummer's Tool Belt, which is just basically they're young kids, six, seven, eight, um, and it's how how to how to communicate with the other band members, you know, on a, on a basic level. And we go through note values and and counting, and we do little flam drills. And I have nicknames for the most popular fills like. Uh, naughty boy, grasshopper, and then around the world, da -da 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 -da. things like that that they can, uh, you know, uh, communicate to other young musicians. Um, a, a shuffle versus straight, shuffle versus straight, shuffle versus straight. We'll do it smells like Teen Spirit, shuffle versus straight. Yeah, and uh, but I was wondering what you would insert if you were to say, if there is a music business anymore going forward, I want to be a professional drummer. What would you put in a, a basic drummer's tool belt that they can walk into a room with four other people and be able to, to communicate um, on a basic level? Even if it's like, make sure to count the band in or another, another one was like, just have a good attitude. <laughs> you can get hired for a lot of stuff. If That's you... actually a really, really, really uh, important one is, is uh, check your ego for lack of a better term. Um, because we all, you know, there's something called the, what is it? The Dunner-Kruger effect. Mm -hmm. um, not sure if I'm saying that right, but basically means we all think we're great. And the way the effect works is you actually think you're greater the less great you are. And as you get better, you realize, oh, I'm not quite as great as I thought I am. And you get better and you're like, oh, wow, I'm really not as great as I thought. And the better you get, the more you're like, I, I know nothing. I really know nothing because your awareness grows. Um, so it's so easy to think that you're great before you are great. Um, so the best way to avoid either turning off other people that you have to work with or doing something that you're really going to regret later is to, to just really don't, you know, 
don't toot your own horn. I know it, it's hard. We live in a culture where um, the squeaky necessary. wheel gets the oil and yeah. where, you know, especially with the advent of reality TV, which was not around forever. It's a pretty recent thing. Yeah. Um, you know, it seems like everyone wants to say that they have attitude and everyone wants to say that they're, you know, uh, get ready because I'm going to bring it. And it's like, you know, that's good to have in your mind, but it's really best if it stays in your mind yeah. and you don't put it on display because uh, it's, uh, it's much more fun when everybody is just, you know, okay with uh, not being the best and maybe making a mistake or two mm -hmm. uh, and learning and just, just making it about having fun, not making it about, you know, a sport. It's not a sport. It's, uh, it's art and it's communication. So, so you yeah, know, you said it. That's, humbleness among the masters is really attractive to me. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a good thing to, to carry throughout everything in life, I think. Um, and let's see, as far as an actual technical thing. Yeah. Uh, I would say try to play with the click. Yep. You know, a lot of people get afraid that, oh, it's going to stifle me. It's going to make me stiff. And it will at first. It absolutely will. It's not an easy thing to do. And you have to learn how to do it comfortably. And that takes time. You know, it may take years. I prefer um, it like you. I prefer it. I get too emotional. I need I need the mm -hmm. the guardrails. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a good it's a good way. It also takes pressure off, you know. You don't you don't have to worry about counting the song off at the right tempo or the things when you're on stage you're you're full of adrenaline and yeah. things that you know all of a sudden what was 120 feels like 90 because you're you're just in a different physical state the chemicals of your body are are doing something different than that they don't do when you're in your practice room and so the click takes all that pressure away because you know it's right and even if the singer looks back at you like is that right you can go yeah that's right and then a funny thing happens you 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 learn to to listen even more and listen better. So yeah, I would throw it can, that in there. It, I think it can be dangerous. I love the click, but there are producers, big producers out there who are, rely on the click. So if you start to rely on the click while you're tracking, you could be like in your head, oh, well, he's going to edit it anyway, you know, but, and it could really round the edges. You know, I've, I, there's some pretty big engineers who've helped me in LA while I was, recording you know he would talk to me maybe like watch your like a four on the floor thing watch your flams watch your flams you know just coaching me along you know and it really sparked um it really got my brain going in that direction that i didn't get the training previous to like now this is really being a pen paying attention to that could really get sloppy in editing so just little things along the way i, I yeah. love the click it does help with editing and it it is um oh absolutely. it can be a positive thing for sure but you don't um as a player you used to you still have to have that. Still got to get your sound across. Still have to have you know throw in throw in your stuff. It's it's a fine line, and it's something you just have to get used to. The yeah, last, I mean, it, it it helps you, especially if you want to work on slower tempos. It helps you uh, uh, learn how to really stay at those slow slower tempos and 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 transition from pattern to pattern keeping that slower tempo mm -hmm. and that's that's what it's really good for um so the last thing i just wanted to cover with this channel is basically about is um so coming back from this injury i was paralyzed uh, for like three days just taking it step by step i was on a walker then i was on a cane and then i'm walking without a cane and then i'm on the kit and i go through all these different kinds of therapies electrical therapy um, uh, blood flow restriction with tourniquets and injecting me with stuff and seeing second, third opinion, spine doctors, but I've had to change my wow. lifestyle, you know, healthier eating, drink water, which I've never done in my life. Even touring and stuff, it's always been drinking, not water. 
Mm. You know, um, so I was going to ask you, you've done so much touring and you're, you, you're working so much that it seems like you're incredibly durable. Have you ever in the middle of a tour or a session come across any kind of injuries or ailments that you've had to come back from and, and found anything along the way that that's helped you maintain your career? Um, no, because I've always been pretty much, uh, a healthy eater. Yeah. And, um, not really that self-destructive. I, I could never understand people who thought they were invincible. That always struck me as, and I just couldn't wrap my head around that. Like even, 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 you know, it doesn't mean you don't throw a bender every now and then, yeah. but to see people do it constantly, I just thought, um, don't you think that's going to catch up to you? And, yeah. and, um, uh, Great. You know, they say life is short, so so you really you really don't want to make it that much shorter. Um, I've on the bees tour, uh, that was a really healthy atmosphere because they, you know, Fred was vegan or no, he wasn't vegan. He ate cheese, uh, but he, the whole band was vegetarian, yeah. and so we actually had a chef that cooked vegetarian food. And, you know, there was never, I mean, this is, this is my introduction to like major, major label, you know, world touring. There's never a can of Coke around. It was always, mm. you know, some kind of healthy soda, um, Crystal Geyser. At the time, Crystal Geyser had these really great raspberry um, and passion fruit sodas that were full of vitamins. I used to love those. Um, uh, they weren't really exercise people, but they were definitely into eating mm. and eating really clean and eating really healthy. And um, the so during I was doing that, and then during the actual shows, I had Gatorade, and I used to drink like three or four Gatorades every night. I stopped doing that after a while, after I realized that sugar. those were full of glucose. Yeah, mm. so. Um, now I'm pretty much just on water yeah. uh, during the show. Um, or, you know, if you can find some really cool, healthy thing that's not, that's not too sugar laden to drink uh, because you're, you're just, you're pounding your kidneys, you know, especially if you're going to do like a full show, two hour show, or maybe even God forbid, a three or four hour show. Yeah. You, you, you're, you're definitely, you know, you're you're giving it your all and every night you're going to the max so you want to um the cleaner the better so now now it's pretty much a lot of water um i just always you know i don't eat a lot of fast food yeah. um hit the gym do any anything to strengthen like the yes gym? yeah i love doing exercise yeah. uh if there's a gym in a hotel i'm definitely gonna and check it out and sauna is a really good thing of course very few <laughs> artists are going to have that opportunity. But if you do, uh, if you're in a hotel with a sauna, go for it. Um, you know, and I just, I just try and stay away from a Any lot yoga? of processed food and refined foods. Um, you know, not so much yoga per se, but, but uh, I've been, doing a lot of tai chi recently that'll limber you up yeah and it's 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 actually a, tai chi is not really a stretching kind of art form it's it's more about just uh relaxing and getting your internal organs all harm harmonized together and your energy you know trying to unblock any kind of energy blockages you have so your meridians and now when I practice, I feel like I'm doing Tai Chi when I'm practicing. Hmm. And it's interesting that you have hit upon Dave Garibaldi because that's probably the perfect thing to practice if you want to really re your nervous system and also, you know, uh, keep your brain plasticity uh, very, you know, uh, flexible because you have, to, you have to have your different limbs doing, yeah. doing you know, different interlocking, changing things. And so 
when I say I feel it's like Tai Chi when I practice now, it's because I just try and relax as much as possible. Yeah. And I also try and play quieter. Uh, and that really, that really requires you to use your body in a completely different way. It's very hard, especially if you're used to like me and like you hitting hard, you know, when you're, when you're doing these gross movements and you're using the whole, the whole arm, you know, it's, uh, and you're playing loud, it's kind of, I wouldn't say easy, but it's easy on one level to make everything fall into place. If you suddenly try and do that at a super low volume, you'll immediately see how much harder it is to control the timing of everything. And so you have to like suddenly switch to these micro, micro operation systems that your body has that you never use. Yeah. That's, and that's got to be great for a therapy. I might have to touch touch on that. I've tried everything else. <laughs> mm. I would say, yeah, like anyone who might be in my position or similar, I'm going to call a C6 incomplete. Hit the drum kit. As much as I'm frustrated every week where I'm like one night, I'm like, yes, I wasn't able to do that last month. And then the next day I'm throwing the drum kit across the room and I won't touch them for a week. Yeah. If you're a spine injury, you know, uh, victim, I would say, get on the drum kit and just go for yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Drums going. That's funny. Um, uh, Fred Schneider, uh, I just wrote one step back. That was my very first major tour experience. My my first band that got signed to Reprise opened up uh, for his punk band. He put out a solo mm -hmm. record called Just Fred, and we, we went out with him. Um, and he was so friendly. He was so nice and. Um, but he, he wasn't around a lot. He would poke his head in every now and again and watch us playing Sega hockey or whatever. But I did remember he was a very healthy guy, very nutritious and kept yeah. very clean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was wondering, technically, a couple drummers have been able to suggest something, a couple haven't. There's a difference. Well, I'm just going to tell you what I'm working on specifically. There's a difference between the heartbeat. One, two, three, four. I'm talking about the kick drum and one, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. Totally taking it for granted pre-injury. Now I'm understanding those work totally different muscles in your legs. And I'm wondering if you were even to just do that lightly, if you can feel any difference in your leg, what you're working and what you're not working on more of a right? like one, two, three, four, da -dum. Mm -hmm. Versus, I'm just noticing. I'm so I'm trying to develop those ankle f quick twitches. Uh huh. It is yeah. working a different part of the leg, and you know, as a as a master. So I wonder if you would be able to phys feel anything physically, even if you were to do it like on the floor. It does feel very different. I know exactly what you're talking about, mm. and. I'm not sure exactly why. Yeah. I don't know if it's I've been because... trying everything at the gym, you know, like toe raises or different weight stuff. And I'm really, I'm really digging in at this point. I'm desperate. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it's a strength thing. Yeah. I think yeah. it's a, uh, it's a coordination thing. And just like learning any kind of language, because music is language. You just have to do it over and over and over and over and over again until it feels more natural. Yeah. Like if you keep repeating it mm -hmm. enough times, your body will figure out what it what it needs to do. It's it's really tempting to try something and try it and try it and say, oh, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what a baby would say if if it expected to learn to walk in you know a week. But you just have to keep trying. You have to keep trying. And your body is an amazingly adaptive tool. And over time, you'll just find that all of a sudden, wow, that feels different now. I found the way to do it, but you've got to, you've, you've got to keep at it and you don't want to overwork it. You don't want to overdo it because then you're going to injure yourself, but you don't want to do it and then stop doing right. it uh, after, you know, a month or whatever. It might take six months. It might take a year, but as long as you just keep doing a little keep bit, keep doing it, don't get so depressed. will eventually get figure off. it out. <laughs> It's all I'm, I'm defragged right now. I keep, I keep getting told your your body is in defrag mode, and it's, you're just going to take mm. a while to fit it all back together. You know, so I, 
a lot of that old screamo stuff, you know, was like eight on the floor at like 150. And I'm like, I'm so close, but it'll, I can get just past that and then I'll run into fatigue. And it's like, mm. never used to be like that, you know. So I'm trying to do <laughs> endurance. Maybe I'll send yeah. you a track to tell you, tell you what I'm talking about. But um, Getting yeah, old really, does that too. Oh, yeah. No, let's not talk about that. <laughs> let's just get a new haircut and like talk about other things hey this was really cool thanks for being like normal and uh <laughs> and and helping me it, it, this is part of my therapy you know talking to people who made me want to play drums in the first place so um th this was uh yeah, it was a surprise and uh i really appreciate your time yeah no this is uh, it was a blast and uh Anything you need in we Seattle, should, let me we know. We should, you know, we should. Okay, thanks. I will um, make sure I have your address. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I might be I might be through there sooner than you think. But otherwise, uh, let's talk again, too. Yeah, I'd love to give you an update when I'm back doing those drills that I was talking about. I'll show you. Now I can do them. You gave me the inspiration. <laughs> All right, cool. man. All right, Bert. I'll send you a link. Um, this, this channel is called Drum Recovery Network, and I'm mm. sure there's a bunch of your friends on there that I've already talked to. So you can see a, a guy who's not very comfortable talking to people, talking to a lot of drum gods, and you can laugh at it. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'll talk to you later. All right, Bye. peace.